Welcome everyone. Um, and welcome to what promises to be a, a, a good 90 minutes of candid discussion and of what our featured author, to, author today calls a reckoning and the sort of reckoning that can lead perhaps hopefully wantedly towards reconciliation. Hi, I'm Dr. Ike um, Wilson III, and it's my pleasure to serve as moderator, your moderator for today's conversation. Before I introduce our author, I'd like to just quickly describe our plan for the next hour and a half. Uh, once introduced, uh, we'll give our author an ample amount of time uh, to talk about his book, the motivations behind the work, the lessons revealed, gathered, and put forth for the reckoning, and his messages to us all on how those lessons gathered can and perhaps must and should be finally learned. Following the author's own talk, talk about his book, I'll take a bit of moderator's privilege and put a few questions to the author uh, about the book, aiming to uh, perhaps just uh, add a little heat to the atmosphere of our virtual space here um, and uh, set conditions for what is sure to be a vibrant living room conversation with you, the audience. So just for a quick introduction, you know, we are certainly privileged to have uh, with us today, Dr. Ty Sedgley, uh, Brigadier General, retired US Army professor Emeritus of the Department of History at the United States Military Academy at West Point and current New America International Security Program Fellow. Soldier, scholar, southerner, and southern gentleman, and that's something that I'm hoping that Ty fleshes out for us and gives us some description. If not, we'll, we'll probe him doing Q&A. Uh, in his new book, Robert E. Lee and Me, A Southerner's Reckoning with the Myth of the Lost Cause, Professor Sedgley challenges the myth and lies of the Confederate legacy, exploring why some of, his country, of this country's oldest wounds have never really healed. Old wounds made fresh cyclically throughout our country's almost 250 hit year history as a nation and over 400 year struggle with America's exceptional form of inhuman bondage, chattel slavery. And made more dangerous, dangerously new again, most recently on the streets of America in the social and racial justice protests this past year, and in the pushback and blowback against the same in the violent siege of the Capitol just three weeks past. And let's not forget the visualization of three weeks past of protesters carrying the Confederate battle flag, a banner for treason and racism through the Capitol Rotunda, which was particularly jarring. The strength of the iconography of the lost cause paraded through our temple of democracy itself. Ty Sedgley grew up revering Robert E. Lee. From his Southern childhood to his service in the US Army, every part of his life was reinforced by and reinforced the lost cause myth. Now as a retired Brigadier General and Professor Emeritus of History at West Point, Ty's views have radically changed. In a unique blend of historical analysis and personal reflective memoir, Dr. Sedgley deconstructs the truth about the Confederacy. And I'll leave that to the author himself um, to break out and describe in, in detail with us. It's an especially proud moment for me to introduce Dr. Sedgley and to moderate today's session. Uh, as Ty and I are longtime comrades in arms, uh, as well as colleagues in scholarship, both having served together for, I think it was a little over a decade, Ty, mm -hmm. during our tenures as professors on the West Point faculty. Ty, it's great to be with you today. And without further delay, let me turn it over to you to talk a bit about the book and the journey of reckoning it so vibrantly captures and conveys. Ty, the virtual floor is yours. Well, thank you, Ike. And I wanna thank New America for sponsoring this today. It's, a, it's really a privilege for me to, to be associated with such a great organization. And um, I have been told before that I have a face made for radio. So rather than uh, look, at, look at me for this entire time, I thought I'd start out with a few slides uh, to tell you my story uh, pictorially while I, while I talk about it. So I'm gonna do my best here to share. Let's see if it works. Uh, and Looking good. Ty. How's that? How's that? Looking is that good. good? Okay. So I thought this is the name of the book, and uh, I wanted to hit you in the nose up front with, uh, with with what my argument is. But now I'm going to tell you how I got there. Uh, and I was born uh, in Alexandria, Virginia, 
uh, as a, a white Southern boy, you can see me rocking those pants with hair. I mean, I'm telling you, uh, the 70s, we missed the 70s, missed those bell bottoms, missed those plaid pants. But on the right, you'll see what was over the mantle in my house growing up in Virginia and in Georgia was this flag uh, that my dad found when he was teaching at Episcopal High School in Alexandria, Virginia, the four flags of the Confederacy. Uh, and the, we know the, the one in the middle left, which is the battle flag that was carried into the Capitol. The one on the far right is the, 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 the stainless banner, the flag of white supremacy, as they called it. It was white to support white supremacy. So I grew up believing, understanding that these were the, were the way forward. I knew the words to Dixie before I knew the words to the Star Spangled Banner. I grew up believing that Lee, on a scale of one to 10, was an 11. And even though I went to church on Sunday, every, every Sunday, I would have rated Jesus at about five. So he was, he was reverential. And every part of my life made me see that. The, one, the book on the right, Meet Robert E. Lee, still have to this day, was my first chapter book. I read it over and over again. It said that Lee was against slavery. It said that he was a gentleman of the old school. And if you look at him there, you'll see that he looks like a military god on loan from Mount Olympus with that Confederate battle flag framing him. Traveler is so smart, he doesn't even need reins as he's going forward. On the left was my textbook that the state of Virginia had. And it looks like it's they're, they're greeting on a colonial version of the Princess Cruise ship. In reality, that is the middle passage, the slavery that that family is going into slavery uh, from Africa. And yet, what does it look like? It looks like they're entering into, as they called it, a social security system. And this was meant to stop, to, to as, a, as a, uh, a way of protesting against massive uh, integrate, uh, massive, it was massive resistance to integration. And in fact, in the sixth grade, I was bused across town from the all white Douglas MacArthur Elementary School to the segregated all black school. And what was the name of the segregated all black school? Robert E. Lee Elementary School. So I grew up in a, in a, as a white privileged man, boy uh, in a segregated world that was made that way to enforce white political power. And one thing that you, so my history, when I looked up the history, it told me things I had never known. So for instance, Alexandria spent all but all of 12 hours in the Confederacy before it was occupied by the United States Army. And it was also originally part of the District of Columbia. George Washington mandated that and up until 1847. And it left to protect the slave trade. And in fact, it was a major hub of the slave trade after DC outlawed it in 1850. It moved there. And so those, if you've been to, around DC, there's still those little pillars of stone that are around the Capitol that you can still find. And, but when Alexandria left, uh, black people in Alexandria had to leave because they did away with all the schools. They did away with black churches. They could not have manumitted free people in that city. So my hometown had this history of, of, of enslavement, of segregation, of lynching that I never knew about growing up. I went to Washington and Lee University. And that's a picture of me back in the hair, when I had hair, those were the days. Uh, and I'm about to receive my commission. And there I am in my green uniform. My hair's a little long, but that's the way we did it back in the 80s. Uh, uh, and I'm about to go by the portrait of Robert E. Lee in Lee Chapel, where Lee is buried. And, and I was, uh, so I went through, and then on the right, I took my commission, received it right in front of my hero, Robert E. Lee, um, with, with all those Confederate flags surrounding me. Uh, I wanted to be a Southern gentleman. And what better place to be a Southern gentleman than at Washington and Lee University? I could get status as a white man there. And then below that is the, the oath that we all take that all of us have taken in the federal service, everybody except the president, which is in, uh, uh, in the constitution, everyone else takes that oath. Well, that oath was written in 1862. It's an anti-Confederate oath written by Charles Sumner to, to ferret out those who were Confederates. So when it says um, support and defend the, the constitution against enemies foreign and domestic, that's talking about Confederates. When it's talking about purpose of evasion, it's talking about Confederates. So that's the oath that we all take. And I took it surrounded by Confederate flags. And I thought that, that I thought they were good Americans doing their duty. And in fact, they were the romantic heroes. Boy, was I wrong. And, and so what, what we have is this lost cause of the Confederacy myth. And that's what I grew up believing. And it's a pernicious myth. Here are the, the parts about it. They're all wrong. Uh, and if you want to go in question and answer, we can go over any one of those uh, about why they're wrong. But, the, but, but what they did was create a system of white political power, uh, which disenfranchised Black America, which 
led to the violent terror against Black America, which led to segregation uh, to a, a racial police state. And the, the, the South of my birth was a racial police state. And this lost cause myth, which started really with, with Robert E. Lee in General Orders Number 9, which happened really immediately at the, at the end of the war, they're trying to, they, the, the South reaped the wind by going to war to create a slave republic. And uh, they, they sowed the wind and they reaped the whirlwind. That which they most didn't want, which was equality for Black America, actually occurred. It ended their social system of slavery. So they had to deal with this loss. And the way they dealt with it was to create this myth, this, this lie, to enforce white political power. And these are all the things that I grew up believing, and none of them are true. And if you, have, if you want to, and the questions can answer, I can go over any one of them and debunk them. But the purpose was this. All those things on the right, segregation, white terror, black disenfranchisement, and Confederate monuments all supported white supremacy. They supported white political power. And the resistance when, when equality starts to come after World War II with Brown versus the board and other things, that there are more, so the Confederate monuments go up during the period of lynching, 1890 to 1920. They come up again after World War II as a reaction to integration. But all of them are for the same purpose, which is to enforce white supremacy. And so if you read the, the, when these statues came up, that's what they are all about. They're about enforcing white supremacy. And that's why calling out the lost cause myth matters because if we're going to have reconciliation. We can only have truth and facts first. And that's why this is so important. So I, I, I graduated from Washington Lee and I went into the army. And these are two of the first places I went in the army. Um, and when I, and I didn't think anything of it. I thought it was perfectly natural to go to Fort Bragg and Fort Benning. And I, I thought I'd highlight this a little bit because as many of you know, the National Defense Authorization Act um, has said that we have to change these over the next three years. And West Point has to change its too. I'll talk more about that as well. And some people are telling me, oh Ty, you just wanna change history. Well, we should talk about first who these people are and what they did. And you'll see what I have on the right there. Remember that Robert E. Lee killed more U.S. Army soldiers than any enemy general in our history. These are people that, that were traitors for slavery. And I'll go into a little bit more on who they are. And they're a motley crew. Uh, they really are. So I'm not going to go through all, who, all of these folks. I thought I'd just mention John Brown Gordon, the one in the center. Brave soldier. Uh, really the only non-West Pointer in the Confederate Army who rose to high command and did well. He was, he was uh, shot five times at the Battle of Antietam and survived and was at Appomattox at the end. But after the war, uh, he never served in the U.S. Army. After the war, he created and led the KKK, a white terror organization in Georgia. In 1868, he gave a talk to Black Charlestonians and said to them, uh, we bought and paid for you. That's why we fought the war. And if you are to demand equality, that will be a race war, and the 30, 40 million of us will exterminate the 3 million of you. And, and then as late as 1890s, and he was governor and senator, he says the purpose of, of the Democratic Party is for white supremacy. Um, Benning on the far left is a, the leading secessionist from Georgia, a leading secessionist in the country, worked since 1849 to, for the dissolution of this country and said, had this apocalyptic way of talking about, uh, about race relations and what equality would mean. Um, Polk was the worst general on either side. So uh, A.P. Hill was a war criminal who, who uh, executed U.S. troops and then fled to Canada after the war because he worried about being charged. Here's some more of uh, that motley crew. Um, PGT Beauregard was a, was a superintendent at West Point for four days before fired for sedition. We have really good evidence uh, that he raped enslaved women. And in fact, his great, great, great grandson on the black side of the family uh, actually graduated from West Point in 2011. Uh, and he brought his enslaved people to West Point, even though it was against New York law for that. Uh, so this is, a, this is not, not a, 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 a terrible group. And then there's Robert E. Lee. Um, I think that we should know this about Lee, particularly that he did commit treason as, as it's the only crime in the Constitution. He was indicted and really just mismanagement on the U.S. part is why he wasn't finally tried for that. But he chose treason. Uh, be, and it, and was, there were eight U.S. Army colonels from Virginia. He was the only one that chose treason, the only one. And why did he do it? Because he believed so firmly in, in human enslavement as a social system and as a free labor force. And he was a cruel enslaver of humans, as, as I say there, as I say below there. 
Um, so I argue that he committed treason, was the only senior Virginian to do so, and he did it to create a slave republic because he, he spent most of his later time in the army running an enslaved labor farm, uh, not as on it with his regiment, the first, uh, first or second cavalry regiment on the Texas frontier. Why did we name them? Why do we name these posts? Well, we named them in World War I and World War II, and we should remember that the army during this period was a white supremacist organization. There was only uh, two black officers, uh, line officers during this time. The highest ranking of them was uh, Charles Young, third black graduate of West Point, a, just an incredible officer. And he rode 500 miles uh, from Wilberforce, Ohio to Washington to show his fitness. Wilson, Woodrow Wilson, the most racist uh, uh, um, president in the 20th century, forced him to retire. And there's what Pershing said about the black forces in World War I. Uh, and they, so we named them during World War I and World War II. One, because the army itself was a white supremacist, a racist organization. Two, for white sensibilities in the South, because remember, because the South was a racial police state, no black people had a voice. They did protest, but they had no political voice because of white terror and disenfranchisement. And then if you see the bottom, the next ones were, were named in World War II, about five in World War II. And this, the Army War College, which was the, the planners in the US Army during this period, had this Negro manpower study from 1925 to 1938. And the problem that they said, the problem was that how are they going to, uh, uh, that, that black troops won't fight. Well, we know that wasn't true, but that's exactly what they said. And they created these manpower studies to show that completely from a racist, standpoint. So that's why we named them. There are other places that are problematic. Uh, the hollow ground of Arlington National Cemetery, which is a, I write about in the book, which is uh, uh, owned, operated by the U.S. Army. Those Confederate battle flags go in there. Um, not the flag of the Confederacy, the battle flag, which is a flag of white supremacy. You can see on the, the, the gravestones of the Confederate markers around Stonewall Jackson Plaza that that was created in 1898 as the Southern Cross of Honor. It was a white supremacist uh, uh, symbol created in the eight, late 1890s. The, if you see the, the monument, 32 foot monument in Arlington, that was there to say that slavery was right, the South was right, it was dedicated in 1914 by Woodrow Wilson, and it is a racist trope. You see on the far right, an overweight uh, uh, enslaved woman with a tear in her eye as she takes her, um, uh, the, the baby from her, from her quote unquote white master, her enslaver, and another child down below. It's meant to show the, the, the trope of the mammy. And in fact, in 1923, we came within a couple of votes of putting a 40 foot statue to the quote mammy on Capitol Hill done by Southern segregationists. So this is a deeply evil uh, monument that is on Arlington National Cemetery that we have not talked about dealing with yet. And I hope that the commission will because it's there to support a white supremacist version of this country. West Point. So this my, my journey really started at West Point when I, uh, uh, when I looked at, tried to figure out, I was walking down Lee Road. I lived on Lee Road by Lee Gate and Lee Housing Area. And I stopped at a sign, I'll show you in a second, for Lee Barracks. And I wondered, why are there so many things at West Point named after Robert E. Lee? I understood my alma mater, Washington Lee, but why West Point? I went into the archives and the archives are what changed me. The facts changed me, the evidence changed me. And what I found was that West Point banished uh, the Confederates in the 19th century as traitors. So the one on the far left, Battle Monument, has War of the Rebellion, only has the U.S. Army on there. The le next one is Cullum Hall, our Memorial Hall, banishes Confederates from it because they, quote unquote, um, uh, forgot the flag to follow false gods. None were allowed in there, none in our cemetery. In fact, duty on our country on the far right, West Point's motto was anti-Confederate. What does country mean? But that starts to change. And the first monuments to Lee come in the 1930s at West Point. Why is that significant? That's when Benjamin O. Davis Jr., the first black uh, graduate of West Point in the 20th century, comes back to West Point. So it is a, it is a, a scratchy Confederate monument at West Point, and it is a reaction to integration, a reaction to equal rights. But that's, and the 19, one on the far left, the 1950s, you'll see an enslaved servant in the background there, that was a reaction to the army's integration forced by President Truman that started occurring during the Korean War. And the army fought tooth and nail against integration initially. The one in 1970, Lee Barracks, 
that's when we start the minority admissions program. And there was a lot of blowback against that as well. Um, and, and then there's the ones in 2001, 2002 uh, that come uh, that are just in, almost inexplicable, except that the one on the left was given by the class of 1961 that grew up with this lost cause myth. The one on the right given by the class of 1957, which also grew up with this lost cause myth. So Lee, the avatar of treason of the traitor is, is really ubiquitous at West Point. So listen, we can change these names. Our values, what we should name these after are those people who represent the values of the United States Army. I put that Medal of Honor up there just because it's a nice little trivia point. That's the original Medal of Honor and still the design for the Air Force, uh, the Navy and the Marines. If you look closely in there, it's Lady Justice smiting the foul spirit of secession, the South, secession, and secession is holding three serpents to show that it is evil. And that's still the one the Navy and the Marine Corps use. And so we should honor those like these soldiers that represent America. Many of these you may know about, we can talk more about who they are. Uh, Reuben down the bottom right survived the Holocaust, joined the army, fought in Korea, fought off an entire battalion of North Koreans to save his platoon, finally captured, went into uh, the, the, the POW camp, he was offered to go back to his original country of Hungary if he wanted to, refused, and yet got food, went out stealing food from the North Koreans, which he would have been shot if caught, to give to his fellow people. We have great people that represent this country, the values, the diversity, the courage, um, and the patriotism of true Americans. And one more thing, you said, uh, Ike was just telling you about this. I tell you, when I saw this, I was ready to put back a uniform on and go kick some butt because it is not only that the flag of treason, if you see the picture in the back, that's Charles Sumner. Charles Sumner was nearly caned to death on the floor of the Senate um, by Preston Brooks because he excoriated enslavers. He, it took him four years to recover. When he came back, he wrote the oath that we now take that was written in 1862 that was then called the Ironclad Oath. Um, he wrote that oath, was the greatest abolitionist in the United States Senate. And to desecrate our, the people's house with that flag in there just drives me absolutely bonkers. And so we can, we can certainly talk about that as well. Um, so that's a, a short synopsis of my book. And it is, um, and this is sort of the theme. I had to come to grips with the racism that I grew up with that I was. And the only way that we can, that we can get to, to a better place is we can't get to reconciliation without truth, without facts. And the truth, telling the truth is a ruthless act. Sometimes we have to rub humanity's nose and the uh, rub the no rub facts in people's nose, and I think that's what I'm doing, uh, and I have to do it because the way I grew up makes me, uh, you know, uh, converts have the most zeal. So I, I thank you for listening to me, but I really believe the only way to prevent a racist future is for us to first acknowledge and understand our racist past. So thank you very much for your attention. Well, wow, Ty, um, I just got to thank you right up front for what I knew I anticipated was going to be a, a fast and furious, but um, incredibly comprehensive and pointed and candidly pointed um, upfront presentation. In fact, you know, I'm, you know, as you were going through your talk, um, you were taking me through my own remembrances of, of my read a couple of times of my read through your book. But frankly, I was, I was here scrambling through my, my moderator question set. And what, I, what we wanna do here is take a few minutes uh, just to, to go back and forth a bit so we can, like I said earlier, heat up the room. But I, I gotta tell you, you did such a great job. You know, I was, I was ticking off questions that I, that I thought I was gonna be able to provoke. Yeah. You already covered <laughs> on that ground, so maybe we can just put some meat on some of the bones yeah, you already, sure. already laid out, but uh, uh, fantastically so. My first question was, to you, and I'm just gonna give you an opportunity. It's, it's quite redundant because you covered it a couple of times in your talk already, but I think it can't um, be overstated. My first question was gonna be, uh, and I guess it will be at this point, um, you know, if we looked at uh, your indictments of uh, Robert E. Lee, you know, in the context of an article of impeachment or articles of impeachment, if you will, um, just in quick order, what would those be? And again, you showed us two slides that really laid that out in, in quick order, but if there's any of those points that you might wanna um, uh, emphasize for the audience, just up front and then we can, we can move on from there. 
Well, I, I'm happy to because I, I really can't say it enough because we grew up with this myth that Lee was the greatest gentleman ever. And, and it was a national myth. It wasn't just a, a local Southern myth. So in 1936, Franklin Roosevelt um, dedicates the, the, the Confederate, the monument to Lee in Dallas, Texas. Uh, this is a New Yorker and says Lee was the greatest gentleman in American history. So this is a national myth. There is Fort, uh, there's a Lee Road in Hamilton, at Fort Hamilton in, in Brooklyn. There was a Lee Highway in the Western part of the United States. So the idea that the losers write the war is just bunk. I mean, that the, the winners write the, the history is just bunk. The South won that. But if I had to indict Lee, uh, the first, I would indict him both morally and legally. The moral, the moral one is he was an enslaver he was a cruel enslaver who broke families apart, who maximized profits at all points. He became a really a millionaire based on the backs of enslaved labor uh, and then and had them whipped. I mean, just really cruel in that regard. The second part of the moral aspect of this um, is, is, after, is, is during the war, which I didn't mention earlier, is that as his army is going into um, uh, Gettysburg, he is kidnapping free black, stealing black, um, free people and br his entire army did this and bringing them back for sale in Virginia. Uh, and then at the battle of the, and he uses enslaved labor throughout the war uh, to maximize his, his number of people that he can put on the battlefield and, and does this further and further and further. Um, and then at the battle of the crater in 1864, um, black troops, the United States colored troops are the first, are the first, nearly not the first, they go into the crater that the, the miners have blown this huge hole. And as they go in, uh, it turns into a disaster and the Confederates attack in and they take enormous numbers of USCT troops. And then his army slaughters uh, captured prisoners of war, a war crime. And, and he should have been held to account for that. So those are the, both the moral and some of the legal. After the war, you know, he says, um, listen, the, the, the quote unquote Negroes have to be disposed of. He says that everyone, every black person in Virginia should be thrown out of the state of Virginia. He talks to the, the, the United States House of Representatives and says that, that black people are not equal and that they should only be the laboring class. And in Lexington, Virginia, when he was college president, uh, black women were sexually assaulted by Washington and Lee, Washington College men throughout it, refused to protect the black people in Lexington. So I've got the first indictment is treason, uh, which is, you know, the constitution only mentions one crime and that is levying war against the United States. He clearly violated that. Uh, and then the purpose of that war, when, when everybody other senior Virginia, Virginia did not, and the purpose which we can never forget, never let the smell of gunpowder overwhelm our sense of the time. And that's what I did. Oh, look at Antietam, look at Gettysburg. Look, isn't that so exciting? And it is exciting. The purpose of this war is so clear. It's crystal clear. It's like digging a bell. And if you can't understand the purpose of the war, every, nothing else will make sense. And when you do understand the purpose of the war, everything makes sense. Ty, um, your last point really resonates with me. It resonates with my own, you know, 30 plus years of research on uh, the American way of war and peace or peace and war, uh, which really is a story of it. It isn't. The American way of war isn't. It's a way really of what you're talking about here an embodiment of, of Robert E. Lee, which when you read through your book, I mean, it just resonates incredibly so of, of a hyper privileging of what, you know, what the great Clausewitz said um, a long, long time ago, privileging of what we would call the military object of war, the tactics and mm -hmm. in the, in the, the prowess of battle and the application of, of lethal force and privileging that as purpose and end and aim um, over the actual political object as, as uh, scholars and practitioners, uh, generals and their civilian authorities alike have long called, uh, understood the purpose of war and, and what makes the abominable sometimes unfortunately uh, necessarily palatable. Uh, um, I, let's, I'd love to just tease that out with you yeah. a little bit. You know, and the way I'll introduce, introduce the teasing out of that a little bit more um, is to ask you about how our, our, you know, our, our shared alma mater, um, West Point, is doing. And let me just start by, you know, what, as I was reading your book, what came to me is that great decades-old West Point Department of History poster. Much of the history we teach was made by those we taught. Um, I think at one point I had that framed and had it uh, hanging in, 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 in my home office at some point. I can't find it. Maybe that's just Providence. 
uh, right now. But, you know, what about our alma mater and alma maters, West Point and for you, Washington and Lee? What are they still teaching about General Lee and his military genius in, the, in this sense that you that you just laid out at the end of your of your answer to the last question? What, what are they teaching right now? What, what are they continuing to imprint on what are on what our um, future uniform military leaders, leaders of character for nation as we intend it beyond the uniform when it comes to their understandings of the meanings of peace and warfare itself? You yeah, know, I, th I think it's a, it's a great question. Right? Look, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Well, I think I think you're exactly right. Ike. I mean, the, the idea of what wars are about are crucial. And the idea that, that getting the, the political goal correct I mean, that is the most, it, it's so far and away the most important thing. And, you know, if you think about the South in this particular case, uh, every, and when it, once it, once the war, when Lincoln really makes the war about freeing enslaved people, then all those enslaved people that come up now join the army, they join the army. By the way, immigrant labor goes into the North because who would want to compete against slave labor into the South? Um, and, and you, and then you, you have this purpose for the war and everyone understood that in 1863, what the purpose of it, they, all the songs said it, um, uh, Lincoln said it, Grant said it, we lost it later on. Now, the way we teach it at West Point is my, when I first started teaching in the mid nineties, um, the book we use written in the seventies had less than a paragraph on the purpose of the war. And it said states rights and, and slavery both. Uh, when we changed it again in 97, 96, just as I was leaving the first tour, they emphatically said that. They said it was the wars about slavery. We started reading about the USCT. And the latest textbook that we created um, is, is, has, even, has an old chapter on the purpose. And I will say that what we also did was we changed, we think what we thought in the Department of History was what a person researches and writes can change your character. So what we did was create these digital sources for our American history course on gender and war. On the, on the civil rights movement. And we made our students, our cadets, write on the civil rights on race and or gender. And what that did was, uh, is to say, listen, this in a way, our army's gotta get this right first. Before we go to battle, we've gotta get the race and gender right. And we don't, we don't have these right. And so from our history perspective, we've been, we st really started doing this in 2013, is to say, we're gonna focus on these things. So we had at least 30 or 40% of our, uh, we have three core courses, of two of those core courses focus on race and gender because we felt like that's the weakness that our army has and we have to fix that. And it, and it's great to talk about the strategy, but the, you have, to, I mean, it's great, you have to talk about the strategy, but part of it is getting your army's composition right and the way they trade, treat each other and to make teammates. And we weren't doing that in the army, we felt. So we had to change our curriculum to, uh, to affect that. I just got to share with you, I mean, you've, you've really given us a great personal and professional example of, of putting yourself forward and an example of, of, uh, of the paradox, you know, the oxymoron of all this. And, you know, as a, as a, as a black American soldier myself, soldier for life now, um, and, you know, for my time as early on as a cadet at West Point, throughout my career, up until quite embarrassingly so, quite recently, um, living the imprint, frankly, um, as a black man in America, yeah. Yeah. of finding a way of honoring um, the military genius of Robert E. Lee, um, privileging even the, the rebels in the fe Confederate cause, despite, to the point of despite the broken at bottom compromise of their political object. Right, right. The fact right. that they were so great at the prowess of what we were taught from an early age and printed to understand as prowess at war. But having nothing to do with war itself, right? Yeah, the other was that lethal application of force, right, right, and the warping of uh, how warping that can be of when you know when you divorce the military application from its political defining purpose, how you you can be at least as you know again Clausewitz here, um, left with something pointless and devoid of all sense. If only Clausewitz were right it would be bad enough, but it's right. worse than being left with something pointless and devoid of all sense. It's being left with something a grotesque, oh, totally. of grotesque totally. proportions and implications. And I think of that in our own, in our own experience right here in um, our own civil war, a uh, particular type of war. But I mean, it, as I reflect on the last 20 years of, of what we've been engaged in, in, in wars over there, in wars of uh, support to uh, countering insurgencies and terrorist operations, we look at the root causes 
um, we take this applicate this warping application of privileging the military application over the political purpose. We skip root causes. We skip all skip all that. We throw in the strategic route. In fact, to a large degree, we still don't even teach our force def definitively, formally the purpose of things, strategy, until around the 15 at the earliest 18 to 20 mark year mark in our professional military education system, and how we bring that forward. Last 20 years of uh, campaigns of, of military application of force that we call wars yet undeclared. And uh, question why we are not um, having a struggle of winning, right? I mean, I think, I think there's a tie here to what you've laid out in terms of maybe part of the Genesis story found in our privileging of the military genius of Robert E. Lee, despite the corruptness of his originating cause. I, I'll, I'll pause there again, see if you just want to put any more meat on those bones uh, yeah. uh, uh, to, to that. Um, I, just one more thing to put onto it. Maybe you can yeah. take us in a, in, in a, a deeper direction here. Uh, the other part of this lost myth, right? That, hey, at the end of Appomattox, App Appomattox comes and goes, and then we are taught to privilege Robert E. Lee for standing up and voicing and tamp tamping down what was going to probably be another 20, 30, 40 years of guerrilla insurgency and how we right, privileged right. Lee with, with tamping down that, you know, putting an end to the war itself. You, maybe your thoughts on that tie to educate us a little bit. Yeah, more. I think there are two things. The first, though, is we privileged Lee as a great military leader and he lost. <laughs> he lost. I mean, we should never forget. He lost. And listen, you know, it was not a set deal that the, that the, and by the way, I never use the Union Army. It makes it seem like it's, it's, it's a, like it's Karl Marx's lost to history. It's in the dustbin of history. They fought only one more. No, they wore the same, same blue uniform you wore, I wore. That's the U.S. Army and U.S. Army soldiers. And the Confederates killed U.S. Army soldiers. So uh, that's the first thing. The second thing about, so Lee was, Lee is, you know, I always put, I just put the L on the forehead. Loser, remember that. Um, and he had a higher casualty rate than did than did Grant. Grant's the great hero. The second thing about the guerrilla thing, okay, let's say, because he gets this and he gets lots of credit. He told his soldiers to go home. What's the alternative to that? The thing about it is, is that they went to war to save, again, it's the purpose. I, they went to war to save their social system of enslavement, of slave labor, which was the entire society is built on this. If they do a guerrilla warfare, what's going to happen to the 4 million people that are in the South that are enslaved? How are you going to deal with them? Now, remember, the thing that scares white Southerners the most is a, a slave rebellion. And if there is, if it's chaos and guerrilla warfare, then guess what's going to happen? Now, the other fear that they have, and it's so ironic, it's, it's like the, the irony is, is they fear the idea of black male sexuality. When in fact, when in fact, white, and I put this in the book, that most white kids, white boys in the South's first sexual experience in the South is with enslaved women or enslaved girls. Uh, we, call, we call sex without consent rape. And I'll just use the word rape. It's rape. So that's the culture there. Not black men raping white women, white men raping black, black women. Nonetheless, could you imagine what the South would have been like? So there was no way that they could do guerrilla warfare with 4 million black people in the South. So I'm not giving him credit for that. The day, two days after the war, he says, you know, we may not, we may not accept this uh, because we want, we'll, we'll need to dispose of the Negroes. So no, you're not getting, not getting a pass from me for that. <laughs> Maybe talk a little bit about uh, Ty uh, as we talk about the hyper reverence to the tactical prowess of a Robert E. Lee, um, and then you just made the direct contrast to Grant the drunkard. Um, where maybe maybe unpack that a little bit because there seems to be also a tie here where we privilege the hyper tactical despite the purpose behind the application of force, and re the real promise, the, the real prowess, the real genius strategic and purposeful of a U.S. grant um, uh, from an operational, you know, the operational art, as we call it in the military, maybe maybe an opportunity to talk about there and how we have our references kind of right. you know, wrong, wrongly wired. Well, Grant not only understood the operational art, but he understood the strategy. And it was very soon in 1862 when he says, hey, they are not going to give up until we destroy slavery. Right. He got it really early on. Grant captures three armies, Fort Donaldson and Henry, captures an army at Vicksburg, and then another one at Appomattox. 
He understands, and then he's also the one that comes up with the great strategy of hitting them simultaneously across the width and breadth of the battle space. Like, I mean, that's our that's our jam there, isn't it? it is. That's our jam. Uh, my jam, anyway. So, you know, we understand, he understands how to do that. He understands how to work for Lincoln, and he puts the, uh, the freedom of enslaved people top among them. And so it puts them in uniform. Now, does he make mistakes? Yes. It, does he? So for instance, he uh, has an order where he orders the ex expelling of all Jews out of uh, uh, Tennessee and out in Kentucky. He does do that. We should talk about that. Um, he did have an enslaved person for about a year that his, that his uh, uh, father-in-law gave him and, and then freed them. Right. So it's not as though he's perfect. But boy, and then if, the thing I put in the book, I love is General Orders 108 which is what he said to his, to his army upon victory. And it mentions the, the, what, that, that you freed a race and welded a nation. That's what Battle Monument said on West Point, freed a race and welded a nation. So Grant to me is the great hero, along with Lincoln, oh my gosh, the political genius of Lincoln and, and both the strategic genius, understanding the politics, and then the ability to translate that onto uh, uh, into, into the, into, on that battlefield, and then the ability to write about it. Of course, he's got the greatest memoir uh, of any soldier ever, ever written. So yes, and now we'll tell one more anecdote about that. So have you ever been in, uh, in Grant's tomb in New York City on the Upper West Side? I went in there a couple of years ago. I was teaching the, the TAC, the course that the TACs get from Columbia. So I went in there for the first time, and I look up, and as soon as I get up there, there's a mosaic right above, like it must be 20 feet by 30 feet, and it's a mosaic of Grant shaking hands with Lee. Lee is, so it's equal, that it was put up in 1965, showing the equality of Lee and Grant in Grant's tomb. Oh my God, I was living, I, I mean, I just, I went, I went ballistic. I just couldn't, I started almost screaming inside of there. And I can tell you for a fact that Grant is not in Lee's tomb at Washington and Lee University. <laughs> and as you said, Lincoln's uh, the penny no face on on the penny of uh, the the face of a penny facing upwards to even look at Lee Repose in Lee Chapel, correct? Right, and in fact, I just heard this. Uh, I read somebody else sent me uh, recently sent me another one. I didn't realize this. The other reason is they wanted that. They, so the pe traveler is uh, was Lee's horse during the uh, during the Civil War. The, the great gray horse. I mean, he, he gets almost as lauded as uh, as Lee does. And and he was buried finally. He was his bones were in the chapel or something, and finally buried in the, in the like 1960s or 70s. And so people go there. They still lay, leave carrots and apples, but they also put pennies. They put pennies face down for two reasons. The first is so that the so that Lincoln Lee, who is buried right next door, can't see the hated Lincoln's face. But I just heard the other one, which is that Lincoln has to kiss Traveler's butt. Oh, so in fact, so in fact, there's it's even worse. And so what usually happens with this lost cause and with this Confederate hagiography is it always worse than it first seems. Ty, how about talking to us and sharing with us your, I think, relatively recent experience, an incredibly courageous one, if I if I can say so myself, of your visit back to your alma mater, Washington and Lee, and giving 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 this presentation. At, yeah. at, at, the, at, the, at the center of gravity, if we will, if you will. Oh man, so I, I was, this was after Charlottesville and a good friend of mine, Ted Delaney, who was a professor there, started out in the early 60s as a custodian. Uh, grew up a black man, grew up in segregated Lexington and uh, went to become a custodian. 20 years later, he became a, uh, he graduated 20 years later and came back as a history professor. And, and he recently died uh, last month, a great hero of mine and was eventually a full professor, professor emeritus and the, really the soul, the, the soul of, of the school. And he invited me back. He knew my views on this. We had talked quite a bit. So I went back and I was, uh, and really it's the basis for this book. It was a speech called Robert E. Lee and Me. And I was invited back to, to Washington Lee in Lee Chapel. So, man, I was nervous in the service. Let me yeah, tell you, I was, I was going back to my alma mater. And listen, I have a funny name. I was on an ROTC scholarship. I am not a man of status. You know, I'm, I wasn't a rich banker. I wasn't a lawyer. I wasn't from a money background. And, and a lot of people from w Washington Lee are. So anyway, I went there and I gave a speech. And there behind me is the recumbent statue of Lee, which is he's lying on the battlefield. It's a, in, in the whitest of marble to, to show his, the white supremacy. His portrait is just to the right, uh, right there. And on that stage, I, I, gave, I just called Lee a traitor for slavery on Constitution Day in Lee Chapel. 
And I was so I like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen to me? I, you know, I talked to my wife, I was so nervous about it. Uh, and the reaction was they gave me a standing ovation. Wow. And I tell you, I, I felt this warm glow of acceptance, you know, I mean, I felt this warm glow that my, oh, my school's accepted me for saying this. But as we all know, one speech does not change society. Right. One speech does not change a university. It takes way, way more than that. And so WNL is dealing with this and they're trying to figure out what do we do with our lost cause heritage? Because it's not the same school that I went to. It's a really fine school, great school, great faculty, great students, but they have this lost cause mythology and this lost cause that is that permeates the school and particularly in Lee Chapel. And they, they just haven't been able to figure out how do we deal with this? So I'm going to ask you a couple of more questions, and then we're going to open it up for uh, some really ample time for a uh, open uh, living room discussion. I think we got the heat exactly about where <laughs> we're right now. But you know, in my own prep for you know for for this conversation today, I've of course read read your book a couple of times back to back. Oh, thank um, you. I can't I can't um, endorse it any any stronger. Um, I think it's a vital read. I think we should be teaching in the in the joint professional to education. Uh, system across the board at every level of that of that um, of that uh, system of education and leader preparation, and I think every American, particularly in the condition state we're in today, um, it should be must must read. And we need to get the bookmobiles of our 70s when we were growing up back on the street and uh, bring everybody in and uh, give them cookies and milk and and <laughs> you know, read a, a broader, more comprehensive coverage of history. But in one of those reviews, uh, um, the reviewer made this point. Uh, uh, she said that. And I'll quote: "Few others could few others could write this book with such sterling credibility." And I and I think that's exactly right. I'll go on to quote: "Only a man of the South, a Virginian, and a soldier with a PhD in history could so persuasively mount the case against a national hero and label him a traitor." And then I'll add my own point uh, from my notes. Boom! There it is. I mean, I think that covers the, the gamut. I guess my question to you is. Um, if we looked at, if you looked at an individual with all the other attributes that the reviewer laid out, a Virginian man of the South, soldier with PhD in history, but it was a black man or woman, um, yeah. could that person be equally, could they make equally make this case and with the same stick and stickiness and with the same resonance? What are your thoughts on that and what it might mean, depending on what direction you go with your answer? I think I'm, well, yeah, I, I think um, racism is the virus in the American dirt. It is infects everything and everybody in, in in our country. It's it's our eternal pandemic, and it's not just a southern phenomenon. It goes from sea to shining sea, and you can look at housing covenants and policies for the VA and the FHA and redlining and 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 segregation in school districts, and and it's it, racism is everywhere. So my answer is is that because I'm a, a privileged white male that was in a position of power uh, and because through the uniform that I have a platform that is absolutely different than if I was a black man or, a, or especially a black woman writing this. It's absolutely true. I would not have the same uh, cachet. Um, I wouldn't have, I would have been ignored far more uh, and it would not have resonated at nearly as much. So I am absolute. it's a great question, I, by the way, it's a great question because I do feel this, this compel, I'm, I'm compelled to tell the story, but I also realize that there's a privilege in just me being able to tell the story. So it's, it doesn't mean I'm gonna stop because I don't, I don't really have a, another way of, of, of getting at it other than through my, but that's the other thing is I gotta tell my story. I can't tell your story. I can't tell another, a black man. So I don't know what that's like to do that. I do know though, that so I'm, I'm probably the the person who's written the most on the black experience in the 20th century at West Point. Yeah. I wrote I, I've written several. I've written about the only person to read about write about the slave experience at West Point. Yeah. Don't know what the black experience is, but history can allow us to get these stories out, and then we can use storytelling to do it as well. So it's a great question. It, I am absolutely privileged because of my my this color of my skin and the position of power I was in. Ty, um, privilege certainly, but I would say you're also representing, you know, that duty on our country thing, right? And I mean, you seem to, it's clear you approach this from a sense of duty as well. And I think that's, yeah. I think we can't, you know, let me embarrass you for a moment. I, we can't, we can't discount that. It's an especially important and vitally um, uh, uh, essential aspect of the American experience in our contemporary moment. 
going yeah. forward. I'm going to ask you one more question. It's going to be a contemporary one because I want to give you an opportunity to speak to it. And it speaks to the, uh, the lost cause statues and memorials that you talked about clearly in the book to detail. And you gave a great summary of it in your uh, upfront presentation. You know, most, much of the lost cause statues and memorials as you educated on under consideration of being removed now are in some cases already removed were erected well after the Civil War, uh, demonstrating just how powerful narratives can be even long after those that experienced those times have long passed, right? Is removing all of these statues the right answer? And how do we use these statues to objectively embrace our past and not perpetuate revisionist history? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think I am a revisionist history. I'm, I'm All history really is a revision, but I would say that, um, that it, in, let me give you an example. In Hungary, what they did was they took all statues of Marx, yeah. Lenin, and Engels, and they put them in a, and Stalin, and they put them in one park in outside Budapest. We can't do that because we're a decentralized system. We have state, local governments, we have private property, we all these. So every community is going to have to look at its statue and say, does this represent our values today? Why was it put up? And what's the context for it? What was the speech that was given at its dedication? And they're going to have to look and see that and see what that is. And there isn't a one size fits all solution. Personally, I hope that in Richmond, when excuse me, when they take down that statue of, of Lee, that they leave the base up with that wonderful graffiti. I think that is beautiful. And now we've created a new artwork that is based on that. But but our, our who we honor isn't our history. So we can still study Lee in the Civil War without honoring him today because he doesn't represent our value, at least he doesn't represent my values. I don't think he represents the values of the United States Army, the most diverse workplace in the country. Uh, Fort Lee is, is home to the US Army logisticians, the finest logisticians in the history of the world. And they're at 50% African-American and their home base is named after an enslaver who fought for enslavement. That isn't the way we should work. So every state, every, state, every city, every locale should do, make their own decision but understand the message you are sending and who sh we have so many American heroes, so many patriots in this country. Honor the people that fought for this country, not against it. I believe I got this right, but you've written, uh, you wrote it, at least one op-ed really uh, laying out, you're right on the leading edge of this conversation of whether to go into the NDAA, the National Defense uh, Authorization Act with uh, the move of um, you know, decommissioning, renaming, um, correct, um, uh, military posts and bases named after Confederate generals, uh, treasonous generals. Um, and I think there's at least one op ed you wrote out there that you actually went and um, identified particular folks. You showed me, you showed us some great exam examples of exemplars for the change, but I think, I know you had have some thoughts on Grant again, um, yeah. of particular posts that would be uh, appropriate for particular individuals. Just want to give you a couple of minutes to maybe yeah. share some of those. So we have those in our mind. In our mind. Yeah, well, the, uh, the one that I, and a lot of people don't realize, Fort Belvoir, which is in, you know, in Northern Virginia, uh, was first named for a, a, a Civil War general named A.A. A. Humphreys. Great engineer, was at Gettysburg, Fredericksburg, Appomattox. And it was changed in 1935 to named after an enslaved slave plant, an enslaved labor farm, a plantation that burned to the ground in 1783, renamed in 1935 as a, as a, to appease a, a Southern segregationist congressman. And it was Belvoir is the name of that slave plantation. And it was owned by a, a, a loyalist to the Brits. And, it, and that Brit loyalist, Lord Fairfax, actually he wrote in his log book, in his sort of account book that he raped enslaved women. So we renamed in 1935, took it from a great person to the name of a slave plantation. So I, I said Grant, the greatest soldier that ever, that ever wore uh, army blue. But I'll tell you, there I, I came up with 10 names, 11 names, because I want to make sure I got Belvoir. And so thanks for saying that, because we got to change Belvoir too, and not many people right. are looking at that. Um, but, but I put a lot of names. But there are so many different names. There are hundreds of names. And it should be a political decision. When this commission meets, it's a political decision to name them. It'll be a political decision to unname them. The reason why the army is changing now is because our political bosses are forcing us to change. And that's the way change has always happened in the US Army. The only way we change is when our political bosses force us to. Uh, integration, uh, co-education, uh, bringing women into combat arms, transgender, gay. We, you know, we can't change ourselves. We, do, we must have politicians do it, and they are leading us now, and I couldn't be happier about that. Ty, um, I'm probably breaking lots of book moderating talk review points here, 
but I want to show your book. And I want to show right next to it to your last point of change yeah, comes yeah. in the right. wake of, of shock and shock's not a, enough. It's leaders that take charge and lead the way. And I'm just, you know, as I was reading right. through your book, right. you know, to secure these rights is another, is another, right. um, to secure these rights, the report of the President Harry S. Truman's Committee on Civil Rights Commission, 1946, a year later, 47 report comes out. Right. Um, a year later, uh, the uh, uh, executive order for desegregation of the armed services. Not an act necessarily of altruism, but an act no. of necessity and an imperative and the shock uh, to the nation that you know we've reached a crossroads and can't, we, we still have a choice of going in the wrong direction, but there's gonna be a lot of pain and suffering if we, if we don't do that. So to your, yeah. just to your point, I want to, um, I want to open it up. I've extended my moderator privilege to the, to the hilt here. Let's open it up. We've got a great um, set of questions already built. So Ty, let me just uh, tee them up for you. Awesome. And uh, you know, you're know you gonna be yourself, the, the person I love. You're gonna be, a, you know, give it give it to us straight and, and oh. candid and provocative. Yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm a punch in the nose. I, armor officer, you know, I armor officer, we go straight ahead. And none of this go, fancy plank and stuff, straight put, ahead. Put the sabo around right forward. Um, <laughs> so let's start with this one. Uh, what was the pivotal point where you knew you had to confront these myths, myths having believed them. Why did you feel the need to speak out about it? Yeah, I think that, that, that there was a, a time at West Point um, after I'd already figured out that I was wrong and I'd done all this research. Uh, when we start, we created this new memorial room, and it was in Column Hall. And we were, it was a. This was after the we had lost like a hundred graduates killed at West Point in the war since 9/11, and we had no singular place that those names from the War of 1812 through the War on Terror came. And I, my committee that I've had, the Memorialization Committee, came up with this idea to repurpose a room in, in, per, in uh, Cullum Hall and, rename, and put all these names in there. But which names should go in? And in particular, should the Confederate names go in? And I argued, like I did just now, strongly. I mean, just like I do now, I'm, I'm, I'm over convert zeal, passion to the academic board that we should not put them in because they fought for uh, against their country, abrogated oath, killed US Army soldiers, fought for slavery. Um, and I lost. The superintendent at the time said, no, we have to bring people together. We don't be, want to be like the Sunni and the Shia. Historian in me like, terrible analogy, boss. <laughs> terrible analogy, boss. So somebody, not me, uh, told a, a black graduate of West Point and he did a FOIA request and all of a sudden, man, all this heat went on me. And they said, Ty, you know, and I, I, I kept I arguing. I kept arguing the same thing. But I went home after I lost the initial initial the round, round of voting. And I told my wife, I said, hey, um, nobody believes me. You know, I've given them all these facts and they're not believing, believing it. And they said, Ty, she said to me, Ty, you're hiding your background. Nobody understands why this is so important to you. So then I started that after that telling my story. And what I realized is by being a little vulnerable myself, telling them that I, I would like this too, that I was more likely to convince people rather than just being a high and mighty historian, uh, bludgeoning them with facts, I could tell them my own story. And my own story was more effective in, in getting people to recognize the facts. That's terrific. We've got a couple of um, questions directly back to the naming basis. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask those in in a uh, in sequence here. Um, how did naming bases in the South after Confederate generals further the segregationist cause? I was led to believe that since the large portion of our enlistees come from the South, that the naming protocol lent to attracting Southerners. Yeah, no, that's not true. So the the, the, the in the first world war, it's different in each war. In World War One. Uh, the way the Manning policy went is that they created divisions from localities. So in, for instance, the 29th division, the blue and gray division, um, went down to Alabama to train. And it was from, the, the, they were from uh, Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, and New Jersey. And so they named the post George McClellan, Fort McClellan is still there to this day. And um, so they named them after these different people, depending on who was training there. Uh, and in World War II, they did it a more centralized. They did it as it came along. And in fact, Omar Bradley was crucial in the name, some of the, these names coming forward. But the reason that they named them only after these Confederates is for two reasons. The first is, it was the thought was to bring America back together after the bloodletting of the Civil War. Blue and gray, Johnny uh, Reb and Billy Yank, Grant and Lee, all of it was equal. Let's, let's highlight the martial valor of bringing us together. 
But we got to remember that bringing who we brought together was white America at the expense of black America because we were segregated, a white supremacist army and, and society during that time. So that, that's not true. And now the reason most of them are in the South today is because through various base closings that we really have these major bases in the South and not in the North. But I will tell you, one of the bases that we closed at right after World War II was Fort Nathan Bedford Forest in Tennessee, named after the founder of the Ku Klux Klan, uh, slaughter of black troops at Fort Pillow and a, and a, and a, and a terrible slave trader uh, before the war. So that's who we named it because he was the hero of white Tennesseans. So it was more about local political appeasement than it was about where the, where the troops were coming from, especially in World War II. Here's another one for you, Ty, um, similar vein. Um, ladies and gents, as a West Point graduate and current army officer, I would offer up the suggestion that we perhaps avoid replacing names of sinful humans with other sinful people, even if they are uh, Medal of Honor recipients, and perhaps replace them with something like battles, victories, or values we hold dear, Gettysburg, Normandy, sacrifice, courage, etc. I believe history always provides those in the future to dig up dirt on any human that we that can erode the value of a name. What are your thoughts on that, Ty? Interesting. interesting. Yeah, I think it's an interesting point, and I, I think that the commission will, will look at that carefully. Yeah. I, I do think that um, that we we end up naming things that that matter to us today. Remember that a, a monument or a memorial tells you about who named it, not who is named. So that's really the, the thing that we should understand. And sure. listen, I mean, there'd be interesting to see if, if somebody eventually we go after Fort Carson. Kit Carson was a slaughtered a heck of a lot of indigenous and Native Americans. Yeah. Um, so there is a lot, there, there are other pieces to, to think about. For, for me now, it, it comes down to basically, did you fight for your country or did you fight to destroy your country? And for me anyway, right now, that's the way to look at it. And I think that we are, we are getting, there's nothing wrong with us having heroes and heroes are flawed, there's no doubt about it. But I mean, a guy like uh, uh, Ted Rubin or Alan Cash or a Vernon Baker, Mary Walker, all these uh, Medal of Honor winners who fought for their country, I think that they're, they're people that we could find. But we do need to vet them carefully, and I think the commission will do that well. But I think it's a it's a fair point to think of the Navy does that. They name it after after a place, not a person. It, it just it just what you just laid out in terms of your 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 thoughts on that on that statement, that insight, Ty. It reminds me of a of a Thomas Jefferson statement. I can't remember during the where during the um, the uh, debates leading up to the to the Declaration of Independence and the war that that was already commenced but followed wholeheartedly after that. Um, where he made the point that who are we, it may have been after the war actually, um, prior to going into the constitution, that uh, you know, his concerns of, of holding sacrosanct, the very constitution that they were thinking about holding, you know, who are we to write the writ for future generations? And he was somewhat of a, at least implying that of a cyclical revisit at least. Right, right. Um, Maybe every generation, I think he even put, you know, every 25 years or so, is there something similar that we should be thinking about here in terms of the rememorialization uh, general, generationally as, as a cycle, at least the, the coming back to a small c constitutional reconsideration or, or reconsideration of our constitution of, of American self? Yeah, um, that's a great point. I, great point. I mean, here's, here's an example of that. Um, at, for those of us who have been at West Point, on the level of the plane, there is only, uh, there, there are two monuments that have not been either modified or moved. And there, there must be a dozen of them there and had been over the course, two dozen of them. Mm -hmm. And yet only two of them, and one of them is Grant, which was just put in last year. And the other one is Eisenhower, which was put in in 1982. The older ones uh, have all been modified or moved, every single one of them, because new new times come in, uh, the Dade Monument to the, to the ones that were killed in the Seminole War. It was the 1830s, nobody cared anymore. And so they moved it to the cemetery. There was a, a cadet memorial moved to the cemetery. Um, Thayer moved around, the statue of Washington moved around. Uh, the, the statue from MacArthur was modified. The, the, the stat battle monument, our huge one, that didn't have the original, in fact, I gotta tell the story. The, the original statue on there, the original statue on battle monument is a 70 foot statue with a female figure. 
And what it said, the first one that happened, one of the professors looked at the original one and said, oh no, it will not do because her gown clings too tightly to the junction of her legs uh -huh. and it will greatly fire up the young cadets too much. So they brought the statue that was 70 feet up in the air and melted it down and put up a more chaste replacement. So yes, we are always changing who we memorialize. And just like we're always changing our history, that's fine. And that's why don't be so, don't, don't worry about it. We're gonna change this to, to, to our values. And just as you said, I, if they need to change it again in 50 years, right. they're bad brother, change them away. The, the act of changing or reconsidering more important than what the change comes out, if any, the act of remembrance, right? And it really re resonates with me, maybe the, you know, the three R's, not reading, writing, and arithmetic, but remembrance, reckoning, Ty, that you bring okay. forward to us right. as essential ingredients on this path towards some type of reconciliation. In the American sense, to back on the path towards a, a more perfect union, maybe no guarantee of ever arriving there. Maybe we never want to, because at any given time, it might come at the expense of a majority minority of, of us. Um, but that remembrance, and I just want to state that up front because I love the fact, I, I don't know if it was planned or providence, maybe a little bit of both, but the fact that we're doing this right. on um, Holocaust uh, Remembrance Day, right, right. I think that's very important to state out front and um, part, of, uh, part of the thing of our own remembrance reckoning and uh, towards reconciliation going forward. Here's another question for you. Um, there is a huge part of America that believes Confederacy and white supremacy is the only way to stay true to America a level of radicalization one cannot comprehend, co comprehend how do we get over this division, especially when people don't care to be educated? Interesting. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I mean, it does go back to our education and it goes to people uh, telling the truth and telling the facts. And we're not gonna get everybody, we've never gotten everybody. Um, there has always been, whenever there is a period, a particularly a period where equality gets greater, there has been a white backlash against it every single time. So we've got to work on that. And I don't have any singular answer other than more truth, more facts, and more education. I am heartened that my children uh, did not get this in school. And certainly, you know, with me around, if they if they got it, that would have been wouldn't have been really good either. But they didn't get that. So I do think that that it, there is a need for for more education, better education, but we're not going to get this. We are a, 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 a we are a violent country. A political violence is as apple as as American as apple pie has always been violent, and it's usually been violent against minority groups that are that are that are arguing for equal rights. We have always been that way, and I think that's understanding that is is a, is, is is certainly a way forward. But I also take hope. Um, I mean, I take hope from from uh, from Barack Obama, from from Kamala Harris, from. Uh, from, I mean, my gosh, if, if you had told me that we would have elected a black preacher from Georgia uh, uh, last, any time in my life, I mean, I was in Georgia, they changed in 1956, the Confederate flag to the, I mean, the Georgia flag to the Confederate flag in 1956. I went to school at a segregation academy in Georgia. I mean, 400 of these schools popped up in 1969 to 71. So the fact that we, that we did actually uh, elect and, and a Jewish man. Remember, there was a Jewish man lynched for a crime he did not commit in uh, Leo Frank in uh, in the teen in the 19 teens in Georgia. So I think there is hope, but boy, it's just going to require a lot more work. I mean, we're we're toward a more perfect union. I just as you said. Right. I don't know no, if you I'm, have I'm thoughts. So on you, I'm so glad you talked about your kids, um, Ty. You know, and uh, that that's where our hope. That's why we. That's why we who we are. That's why we teach. Right. Um, not just for our kids, our own kids, it begins there, but, you know, posterity, you know, as John Adams talked about, um, it's on them to make sure that what we do, what we've done yeah. was worth it. Um, but that's for another, another day and another story. But what you do remind me of, I mean, you have a very positive story. I'm going to stick with that one, but I can't, I can't not uh, mention uh, just a few years back, short years back when my, my daughter was uh I think she was a junior in high school at the time. And I, she always hides her books from me. And you probably have this experience as well, Ty, because as soon as I get a hold of the book, I dig into it and then they come in for an extra evening lecture to uh, di dissect why, you know, what they're reading, why they have the textbooks they have. But on this one occasion, um, it was on the steps and I got a hold of it. And uh, 
inside that textbook. I mean, this is this is no less than four or five years ago, an, an inset in the in the U.S. government book that talks about uh, American slavery and slaves as quote unquote guest workers. Oh my God! An oh. inset in the chapter of the textbook. This is this is less than a half decade ago. So, you know, again, towards more perfect union, um, not perfectly uh, progressing small p uh, forward. Um, you know, examples of lynch lynchings uh, very proximate to ourselves. We don't have to reach back to the to the, wow. to the 19 teens to have examples, uh, late 1990s, 2000s lynchings. Um, Jasper, Texas comes to mind. I was living there at the time. Let me, uh, let me get to another question here for you. Um, this one's going to get us back to um, a bit. It's going to let you stretch out your his, your historian uh, um, uh, feathers here. So I'm going to give this one to you. During the first secession uh, convention in February 1861, Virginia voted to remain in the Union. Two months later, after the firing on Fort Sumter in Charleston and Lincoln's call for 75,000 90-day volunteers suppressed the rebellion, the Virginia delegates voted a second time for secession. If Virginia had voted again to remain in the Union in April 1861 instead of leaving, do you believe Lee would have remained loyal to the Union? Oh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of, uh, I mean, that, that's a, a lot of, uh, of what ifs. I don't know if I'm comfortable yeah. saying that many what ifs. I do <laughs> say, though, that when secession was uh, was voted on um, first that it that in Virginia that that Lee did not wait until the referendum, which was done in May of 1863. He left uh, in March. So he he as soon as the how as as the the remember it had to be so there was a vote in the sort of General Assembly in Virginia that said to leave after Fort Sumter. But remember that the violence that was created there was done by South Carolina and the Confederacy was already done by the Confederacy. They were the one that started the violence. And if Lincoln had not called up volunteers, then basically you would have said that and they had already violently taken a bunch of other uh, U.S. ports. So I think, one, I don't blame either Lincoln for calling up volunteers. And in fact, the Virginia or, or the South had already called up uh, volunteers before that had ever happened. So yeah. they were hell bent on war. And I think we should remember that. Um, but we should also remember that Lee, uh, when Lee chose, when he chose treason, um, there were other, many other Virginians that did not. He was the largest enslaver among people in the army. And he did, and many of his family members did not choose treason, stayed with the United States. And, and, and most of the other ones that did finally go waited until after he did. So he and when he did resign, he didn't wait until the paperwork had passed through the War Department. It was supposed to take 30 days, it only took three days, but he still wouldn't, he, didn't, he waited less than 36 hours before he took the train to Richmond to accept the commission in the Virginia, uh, in the Virginia Army. So I, I, I'm, um, I don't know what Lee would have done then. I do know that his undying belief in human enslavement meant that he never thought that, uh, that slavery should go away. Incredible, incredible. Um, here's another one for you. Uh, unfortunately, it seems that the US armed forces have members, current and former, who are susceptible to the rising trend of white supremacist violence, violence in this country. For example, we saw some vets take part in the January 6th insurrection of the Capitol. How should the army approach recruitment and training for its members, particularly for those recruits who do not go, who do not go um, into, I'm assuming, into U.S. military institutions with such comprehensive history courses like West Point. What responsibility does the U.S. military have today in countering white supremacist violence? We do absolutely have a, have a responsibility. And so I think there are a couple things to do. One, we need to ferret it out and there needs to be go in and look and make sure that there is no one that is in the U.S. Army or military that is doing this. And if they are, to to to, to uh, prosecute them. Um, now, among the 18 million veterans, harder to figure out how to do that. I'm not sure that's the military's job is to on the veterans, but for those in the, in the military, absolutely. The second thing is, is I don't think that we talk about the history of our forces nearly enough. 
So we often have, we have Black History Month, Martin Luther King birthday, but, and, and those are main, mainly about uplift as well they should be. But what we don't train in, or we don't educate either in basic training or in officer education is why do we need to talk about those first, the first African-Americans who were able, who went in we have to, the reason they did it is because of white supremacy, white segregation, um, a racist policies. And that I think is what we don't talk about. And so I do think that in basic and in others that there does need to be training about uh, education about that. If you think about the Marine Corps, they're great about a culture of talking about the way the Marine Corps was formed, but they don't talk about the policies of the Marine Corps that led it to racist policies throughout most of its history, most of its history. So I do think that 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 our troops are not going to understand this unless unless they have that. So the Amer our, our military is a reflection of society, and we have racism in our society. We're going to have racism in in the military, but the military has a great um, need to stamp that out, and our politicians have to demand it of the military, or we will not do a good enough job of it. Ty, one of, the, one of the things I loved about your book uh, in the education that it, the learning experience it walks us all through the most, and you spoke to it again in your, in your answer here a second ago and earlier in our conversation. What I love the most about it, maybe it's because I'm a political scientist, right? You're a historian, I'm a political scientist. So I'm always looking for, you know, correlation, causation, understanding the two are not the same. But you do a, a brilliant job of, um, telling, you know, chronicling a history, a small p progressive history, um, progression of history uh, that makes clear that their history doesn't rhyme. It doesn't repeat itself. Sometimes maybe we do, particularly when we don't know history and there might be a rhythm to it. And there's, there's a clear, at least undertone. Um, I would say an overtone with, with you, my friend Ty. <laughs> uh, I appreciate it. Of, um, this cycle, right, of uh, positive correlation, a political scientist might call it, of, you know, every time you see a, a progressive move forward in fuller in integration, acculturation, um, you see a, I'll call it a white lash, yeah, right, right? institutionally, culturally. Um, I'm reflective of the last three weeks, maybe the last, certainly the last year, hell, maybe the last four five years. Um, thoughts on that? Cycle cycle continues, cycle running? Yeah, and I'm, I'm, as a historian, I'm not a cycle guy, and I'm not, yeah. that, that's not the way we think. No, but, right. there's, yeah. but, 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 if you look at it, and you just look at the history of it, if you look at, at Civil War Reconstruction, and then the segregation and violent, and the violence that came after that, I agree with you, because what it says more than anything to me is, there is a, it's about power. And that's about the politics and power. And every time that there is a, a movement toward more equality, there is a pushback on those that have had power thinking that it is taking their power. And that white lash is about political power. And because white supremacy, racism, um, uh, inequality is all about maintaining political power for one group over another group. So I think you're right. I mean, you can, and we can look at the reaction to Obama. We can look at the reaction to uh, uh, to the civil rights movement. We can look at the reaction to Reconstruction. So I, I'm, I think that's absolutely, I think it's, it's true. And the idea of how do we stop that white backlash? I right. think if I could figure that out, man, I would, I would be, I would be all over it. I have not figured that one out. No, that's great. Thanks, thanks for that, Ty. Um, let me ask you one more here. I might be able to sneak two. Um, let's see. Um, some schools specifically in the state of Arizona um, require parents to sign a permission slip for students to learn about slavery. Huh. Hmm. If we are limiting knowledge on how history, on how history um, is, I'm assuming is taught, how do we intend to grow past it? That's yeah, I, yeah I, said, I think there has been some uh, uh, where, where teachers have gotten in trouble for, re, for trying to do experiential learning by creating a slave market. So they, I've seen that where, you know, they put people, uh, particularly people of color in sort of a, on a slave market to show the way that went. And that has been traumatic. And this is why a, a teaching slavery is hard. And I think it's uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center or the Equal Justice Initiative, both in Alabama have come up with ways of hard history of how to teach hard history. But we, of course we have to do this. And part of the reason is it's fascinating. 
I mean, the thing is that if you talk about these issues that make us Americans, students love teach, love under, they love grappling with it. But it does require uh, teachers to have an understanding of what that is. So um, I'm certainly not in favor of, 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 of needing this. But what has happened probably, and I don't know this, this particular case, but I do know other cases where teachers get in trouble for trying to do experiential learning, uh, particularly with slavery, and that gets them uh, out over their skis and in areas that they're not qualified to do. But are we, should we talk about the horrors of, of, of enslavement, of the slave error, of the, the rape, of torture, of mutilation, of selling families apart for profit? Absolutely. That's great. One more for you quickly, um, um, Ty. Uh, so we have the first African-American Secretary of Defense in our history. Uh, and last year we had the first African-American member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, Chief of Staff of the Air Force, General uh, C.Q. Brown. If you were approached by Secretary Awesome how best to address racism and extremism in the ranks, what would you recommend? And how does the reconciliation with our history telegraph a way forward? Yeah, well, I, I, let me, I, so I got to tell about uh, Secretary Austin first, awesome. um, who uh, uh, graduated from West Point in, I think, 1975. And I wrote a long article and I've written several things about the Black Power Movement at West Point. Mm -hmm. and, and what happened was Nixon came to West Point in 1971 doing the Southern strategy, which is to turn the South Republican. And he ordered the superintendent to put a Confederate monument on Trophy Point. And when he did this, uh, the superintendent at the time, uh, a guy named Knowlton, brilliant man, told the senior, the, the senior black cadet, a battalion commander, Percy Squire, about this. And Percy and the, an entire, all of the black students, uh, black cadets there, wrote a manifesto uh, listing all their demands. That's where we get Buffalo Soldier Field. Uh, the Afros go from here to here. Right. I mean, it's an amazing thing. But well, one of those cadets that signed the manifesto that was as, as one of the, and I'm quoting here from my friend, Percy Squire, who uh, led this, he said, Lloyd Austin was a righteous brother. And, 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 and Austin's howitzer quote, that's the yearbook, Ike, you know, the yearbook, the yeah. yearbook. his quote was from Nina Simone, young, gifted, and black. Oh, that's brilliant. Isn't that brilliant? That wonderful? Really? And he's got an Afro out to here. Oh, um, so the idea first that all military people are alike is just not Michael Flynn and Lloyd Austin. I mean, my hands can't get further apart than that. Yes. Mine um, either. I'll right. add mine to you and we still can't get far enough apart. Still Go ahead. can't get far. I think yours and Ford and mine in New York, <laughs> if we put them together, we still can't get far that's enough exactly apart. Right. That's right. That's exactly um, right. So I, I think that, that Secretary Austin is on the right path of forcing, of looking and holding people account for racism in the ranks. And But this is a hard problem. One of the problems is, is that if you look at our, our logistics, the finest logistics in the history of the world, it's 50% African-American. Infantry is vanishingly small numbers of black officers and even black troops in the infantry branch. And it's the same for pilots. Uh, in, in both of the Navy and in the Air Force. So right. there's a lot of work that we have to do uh, to figure this problem out. And it's not, it's not a simple one to figure out, but finding white supremacy in the ranks, that has to be something that we get after. And we need to put people that have those views uh, out of the military uh, as soon as possible. It's, it's, it, we cannot stand anybody who does not have the values of the United States of America. That's what we are. We are a great army because we represent a great country. And if we represent the, if we don't represent that, you don't deserve to be in uniform. It's a privilege to be in uniform. It is not, um, uh, and so too many veterans and too many people in service think that, 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 that the nation owes us. No, it's a privilege for me to have served as long as I did. Well, Ty, my friend, Dr. Sedgley, let me, let me just close the session or begin to close the session by first thanking you uh, for your talk and, and your offerings and for being with all of us today. Um, when the debate over the Union Army seizure of Arlington, right, uh, Robert E. Lee's 1,100-acre uh, estate across the Potomac from Washington, D.C., uh, when that debate reached the U.S. Senate, there was a Senator, Charles Sumner, who led the anti-slavery forces in the Senate, who railed against the slaveholding Confederate General Lee by saying this, quote, I hand him over to the avenging pen of history. Ty, my friend, you have wielded that avenging angel's pen brilliantly and with great intellectual and personal courage. So bravo, my friend, and duty well done. And I'm gonna give you the final word, but before I do, just a word of thanks to all the participants, to New America and, for, and to St. Martin's Press 
And again, to all of you, the audience for participating, the good trouble still, trouble still awaits and continues. And uh, my friend, uh, sir, Ty Sedgley, final words to you. Well, I, I have two things to say. The first is that uh, as James Baldwin once said, if, and I'm paraphrasing here, if you love your country, you must criticize her ruthlessly. If you love your country, that's what real patriots do. So I love my country, you love your country. Uh, criticizing it does not mean you don't love it. And the second thing is, I thank you so much for preparing so well for this talk. I can really tell it. I mean, you really, really got uh, everything you could out of me and out of this book. And I, and, I, and I so appreciate the real care that you took. Magnificent job. And for everyone at New America, thank you for doing this. And for everybody that came from wherever you happen to come, thank you for listening to me and for, uh, uh, for joining me in, 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 in my own journey um, and, and as we try to make our nation more just, at least that's what I'm trying to do. Thank you very much.